from Galvanize, San Francisco. Extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering the Apache Spark community event. Brought to you by IBM. Now your hosts, John Furrier and George Gilbert. Okay, welcome back everyone live here in San Francisco, Silicon Angles Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm my co-host, George Gilbert, Wikibon's big data analyst, again, live in San Francisco for a special presentation for IBM Spark Community event that's happening tonight. We're here on the ground. We'll be doing live interviews till nine o'clock tonight and covering Spark Summit all day today and tomorrow we'll be at the Hilton in San Francisco for the Spark Summit. We're unpacking the big trend around what's going on in big data. Spark is, really changing the game literally overnight. IBM's con contribution has been significant. And here to break that down is our next, next Tam Tamir. Mike Tamir, Chief Science Officer for Galvanize, which is where we are right now. This is an incubator or workspace, education place. It's kind of like a melting pot of all that great innovation action of best of the startups with growth and education, and of course, shared workspaces, which is the ethos of San Francisco. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So you. great to see you guys successful. It's really exciting to see I won't say incubator, but that was the early days of these workspaces, which was, you know, back in the days when blogging started, when I started doing blogging and podcasting was, you know, democratization, sharing economy, before it was called sharing economy, sharing mm -hmm. some space, also because it was kind of cheaper to share space. That evolved into kind of this whole seed movement, this whole web 2.0, now cloud, and then startups. But then what really happened was this real business need, so there's education, there's code, the new technologies, and you guys have really, really grown. So talk about Galvanize, and how's that fitting into this culture in San Francisco? Yeah. So I like to describe Galvanize and each of these campuses as a sort of a teaching hospital for data scientists and web developers of the future, full stack web developers of the future. Um, the tech industry is a place where you, you need a lot of that, of that background understanding. You need to understand what it is you're working with, what kind of data science tools you're doing, what kind of machine learning you're doing. But you also need that experience on the ground. And you see all sorts of articles out there about why people can't find the right talent in data science and that why there's such a dearth of talent, there's such a vacuum. And the reason for this, we believe, is that there's not the right, no one's got the training recipe right uh, for training data scientists, training web, web, full stack web developers. And we do that by, putting the students in, not just in the classroom, but in a classroom that's in an industry environment, and that's what you see around you here. We have hundreds of member companies on over 70,000 square feet on this campus alone. We have uh, six campuses going on seven very shortly across the nation, and we are continuing to grow, building out those industry environments. Galvanizing the industry, you guys got a great name. So let me play the stats again. Seven campuses, 70,000 square feet here, 70,000 square feet, feet here in Seattle, and we just launched in uh, Denver Platte also. You know, wow. just an analogy, it sounds like community colleges were always very um, uh, professional oriented, occupationally oriented, where it's liberal arts where, you know, we'll teach you how to think and then when you get to your job, you'll learn how to do the job. This sounds like a cross between them, like it's community college in terms of its time and focus, but um, with the with the errors, you know, and the really advanced learning that you might get, you know, at a research university, the time time collapsed. Yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, intersection there. So we actually have three different uh, classroom programs right now. We have the full stack web development program. That was our original program uh, through what was formerly G School at Galvanize. We also in uh, this last fall we launched our data science immersive program. This is a three month uh, immersive program that takes the students from core skills, knowing the background, math, and coding ability, to the uh, to entry level uh, data science jobs, and sometimes even very advanced jobs. We actually um, just had two of our students and one of our instructors compete in the, uh, in the hackathon this weekend using the, uh, the IBM Spark platform, and just found out moments ago that they won the uh, they, they won the uh, the competition, uh, and one of those students, Jose, is uh, actually was just placed at PayPal at a director level position. So we really focus on getting students. This, into a, pay, that. this is a great payday. I mean, if you can come <laughs> in, we were just talking about the data warehousing and the business intelligence market of my generation, and it's like that movie Office Space. Give me the TPS reports. It's like boring world 
and it's not wasn't moving very fast. It's like go get stuff from the back room, bring it, do a report. Now it's in the front lines. It's at the center of the action, relevance, and it's a money maker. Mm -hmm. So if you can get those skills, it's big. So what, given that, what kind of growth do these guys look for in terms of salary requirements? Give me an example of a guy who's come in like that example, and what are they making kind of a salary out there? So median salary for um, for data science immersive students is in the low 100, so 110, 120. Uh, I don't have the exact figures, uh, but it's pretty good coming out of a, a three-month program. We also have our uh, our third vertical is the Galvanize U uh, powered by UNH Master's program, and this is a 12-month program that's designed to get students from square zero all the way to that expert level data science that uh, data science unitor. And this three months is immersive program program is three months? The immersive program is three months. The master's program, which is fully accredited, is 12 months. 12 months. Okay, that's awesome. Well, that's, you know, more and more people are online, the MOOC, and also coming here, getting immersed mm -hmm. in our 12 months. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Um, <laughs> George, pretty amazing, don't you think? This is, I mean, how do you scale this? Not just you, but others in the industry. It, it seems to fill that gap where, you know, that, that there was that McKinsey that article about, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to have... Boy, they got that right, didn't they not, yeah, right? 600,000 I mean. short, you know, but they don't say, you know, institutions like this can spring up and fill that gap. We can have better tools to make it more accessible. How is this scaling, you know, not just with you, but across the country? So, uh, yeah, that, that uh, McKinsey report that you're yeah. referring to was sort of a, a, a large alarm bell that there is so much need. This is a, the HR version of a data science product waiting to be built, right? We, we're creating data scientists here. We're scaling out, obviously, very rapidly, and we're right. doing that um, very, very prescriptively. We're, we're thinking about what kind of data scientists is the industry looking for, and then trying to, um, to, to give our students those abilities so they're able to. Are you working with um, the consumers of those data scientists? By consumers, I mean those who want to employ them on the curriculum? Absolutely, yeah. We work with our hiring partners, with our, um, with our member companies, so the companies that actually work here on galvanized campuses, and also with our large enterprise partners like IBM. So I gotta, I gotta ask about the, the, um, the McKinsey report because actually that's a great example of a miss. McKinsey is supposed to be this huge brain trust, and and, my, and I always said not dissing on McKinsey. They just didn't see it because they're they're reporting what they see, and to quote Steve Jobs, it's always that what people you don't see is what the real innovation comes from. And I think this is a new generation of stuff that's coming out of the woodwork where it's just fresh perspectives, clean sheet of paper, you know, the blind, you know, young, unconsciously competent developer has no idea that they're slaying sacred cows all over the place with DevOps and, and analytics. So, you know, McKinsey points to, oh, that'll never work, and then all of a sudden it happens because technology. And that's really where the innovation comes in. So I want you to, to, to take us another example of, of where the average consensus is, oh, that's never going to happen. What does Spark do that will keep the skeptics at bay, because everyone's always like, well, you can never hire a data scientist, to, there'll never be enough data science. Well, that's the definition today. That's broadened. Mm -hmm. Where do you see an example where people are missing the boat on, on their analysis of the market? So I think Spark's a good example. Uh, four years ago, uh, Hadoop was the, uh, the next thing. Everybody, there was a lot of hype about it. Everybody thought that it was going to uh, save all the data processing jobs with MapReduces which had actually been around for quite a while. Uh, and nobody realized that uh, in-memory computing was going to be the next big thing. Spark was going to help guide uh, not just that, uh, that MapReduce distributing over several nodes, but being able to tactically and with these, uh, these, these lazy calls figure out how to pipe data processes across multiple different nodes in a way that's going to make you be able to do things like machine learning very effectively and at large scale. Um, so this is one of the innovations that has come around just in the last several years. Um, and how do you see it shifting, just order of magnitude, and that, you know, revolutionary, game-changing, I mean, how, just kind of put some color around the I shift. think I, I think only time will tell. Uh, there's a lot of great innovations out there. Spark is, certainly has uh, a lot of momentum behind it. And with the investment into the machine learning on top of Spark, on top of what's going on with MLlib, uh, there's a lot of potential here to really have it take off. Um, I wouldn't put all my eggs in any one basket because, yeah, yeah. of course... Well, that's <laughs> the thing about open source. You can try machine learning from IBM. If it 
provides some goodness, you use it. If not, it's mm -hmm. still open source. It's not like it's any hooks in there. That's right. That's right. Maybe uh, you know, d tell us if this if this is um, sort of appropriate for you to try and make sense of this for us. But we see um, IBM coming on and contributing um, th the their machine learning uh, platform. We see you know MLlib being the sort of official um, or standard repository for the algorithms. Mm -hmm. There's Spark streaming, but there's also Storm on the, on the Hadoop side. There's Samza. There's uh, um, uh, uh, data torrent. Um, help us make sense of all these in terms of are, are we going to see a sort of f fragmentation or is there a unification that can come about? So I think the best way to think about it is uh, the way you think about uh, the, the tools on your tool bench, right? Uh, each of these, you know, you might have several different kind of hammers for different kinds of jobs. You might have several different kinds of drills for different kinds of jobs. Uh, they, they don't all, they're not direct competitors. Um, they're still very much a place in the world of, uh, of large scale data engineering for Hadoop uh, along with Spark. But Hadoop is really more for um, you know, successful architecture and, um, and warehousing right now rather than doing the distributed machine learning. Uh, there was a lot of hope that we could do that with uh, the open source project Mahout. So it's, the, it's more the data warehouse complement right now. Yeah, they're, 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 they, are now, they are now evolving as different tools for different jobs. And then on the, on the Spark side, is that, um, is it not just Spark streaming, but can you apply, you know, the SAMSA um, streaming, the, the data torrent stuff? Is that all, can that all fit in the Spark ecosystem as part of its real-time underpinning to complement the machine learning and the graph processing? Yeah, it, so certainly it can as the, you know, Spark is very young. Um, <laughs> and so it's, it's probably a little too early to see what's going to cotton on as industry solutions, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, there are very sophisticated architectures out there that might use all of these tools for, for their best purposes. What's the biggest thing in education you're seeing in terms of the learnings? What's the profile of people coming in? What are you seeing? Just demographics, if you can just share some insights into the range of people coming in for the immersion program and then the 12 month program. And then sure. just in general, what's the appetite for the education on top of it? So uh, the appetite is huge. Everybody wants to become a full stack web developer. At 110 the salary <laughs> starting, it's like yeah. you know, a pretty yeah. badass opportunity. Right, well, and even, yeah, even more so for the data scientists. Ever. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the most exciting fields and it's getting to do some of the most, some, some of the, the most exciting stuff that you see out there right now. When you use Netflix, when you use uh, Amazon, you're actually seeing machine learning in action. When you use Google, you're doing information retrieval. You're seeing it every day. You're interacting with it every day. And a lot of people are interested in figuring out how that works and being able to improve on that. And that's exactly what the data science opportunity is all about. All right, so what do you think about IBM? Obviously, they're working with you guys here as part of a joint effort, as part of their um, community event. You've got a great facility, you've got great um, access to the education, you're part of the million million um, education number there, million developer march, I call it. Mm -hmm. um, how's that going? What's your take on their strategy? Just that they're executing well. I mean, IBM's pretty heavily invested and they're not mailing it in. Yeah, uh, this is very exciting. They're putting a lot of momentum behind a project that's already had a lot of momentum and I think that's going to help uh, see a lot of maturity uh, much quicker than we might have uh, we might have saw originally. I, I mean, IBM has the playbook. I mean, they did it with Linux, mm -hmm. and they did it successfully. Now I know that it's different now than from then. Then was other. They also had a mini computer as well, and so different marketplace than Linux and Unix was evolving. Mm -hmm. But still, it's a systems management world now. And the fact that Berkeley's tied to it's ironic, at, but probably tied that way. The history of systems programming really looks was Berkeley, right? One of the main mm -hmm. places. Now, with Hadoop and now big data, DevOps, again, Berkeley's in the center of the action for this kind of what I call new system operating system. I mean, IBM calls it an analytical operating system. What's your take on all that? How do you put that together in your mind? And look at this world of new, the new modern infrastructure, the modern software, cloud. Yeah, so it's, it's tough to come up with a good analogy, right? Um, so, so the the analogy of you know the in the old school you ha you had a 
laptop and you, or maybe you had a desktop <laughs> and you had your, your, your operating <laughs> system on top. Uh, now it, it's very different, right? And so we, um, we can kind of think about these analogies between you know, the operating system and the data. You don't need a class on how to load Linux on a server and update patches. Mm -hmm. I mean, that class is no longer exists. That's right, right that's right. <laughs> and and where, you know, things are moving so fast, and they're moving faster now than they did in the past. Uh, part of that is because we have a lot more connectivity. There's a lot more opportunity for open source projects to really take the best and crowdsource that information from across the world. And this is something that yeah. has really driven the move to open source development and a, a, a analytics as a service as a business model now um, for new products. Great. The, there's some, when, you, when you bring up open source, I mean, we've, the open source wave has been rising and, and cresting for many years, but we are at the point now where it seems no enterprise infrastructure software can be sold closed source. And products that were, you know, that have 10, 15 year histories are going open source. What changed in the community and in the buyer's perceptions to drive that? That's a, that's a tough question to answer veritically. Um, <laughs> I, would, I, I would go back to, uh, to what is just my opinion that one of the biggest parts about why these open source projects are so successful is that we've taken the best contributions from across the world and you know more and more human production is not about one person going in a room creating one thing all on their own it's about collaboratively working on things and getting the best bits of and of ideas all across and with the uh, collaborative tools that we now have and that has it's growing we're we're getting better and better at that with uh, you know particularly with all these uh, open source uh, commit uh, technologies do, do you see um when you plan out the, um, the way you're going to teach your students over time, do you see um, raising them up to um, more accessible tools, you know, from deep systems programming? What might that look like over time? Yeah, so um, we don't teach very low level object oriented programming right now. Uh, we do a little bit of, uh, of you know, Java for the data engineering verticals that we're launching later this summer. Uh, but for the most part, data scientists can get away with just using Python. And that means that um, you know, Python is an object oriented language, but it's not terribly low level. Uh, and you can, that's an advantage. Uh, in, it means that you can learn a lot of the uh, machine learning algorithms and all of these things uh, a lot more effectively. You can take advantage of already created um, pieces of technology that's that are out there. It's a shortcut too. It's actually a building block that you can have in your tool chest, if you will, as a developer, mm -hmm. without uh, having to go all in just on a vendor, so it's open source. So you can play around with it, develop some innovation, but the end game starts to get on the integrated stack piece. That seems where the action is. So great uh, contribution there. I mean, do you see it the same way? Or, I mean, ML is the machine learning as the, the building block to get started? Sure, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's great to get your hands dirty early to see how these algorithms work and to be able to work with them quickly. That doesn't mean that we don't want our, uh, our students to all be able to come out with the chops to code up this stuff on their own, and we make sure that they're able to do that. But that's only a piece of it, and it, you, you can, uh, when you circle around and start with getting familiar with these algorithms, getting used to it, you're able to sh cu sh cut down on that cycle time much more rapidly. And, but I also wanted to get to you know, even if you're in Python, which is, you know, I guess a fairly accessible language compared mm -hmm. to systems programming, might we start seeing something even a little bit higher level, like I might be dating myself, but Visual Basic, where some <laughs> amount of it is, yes. you know, graphical drag and drop, and then there's, you know, coding to extend that, like a framework, part visual, part coding. Yeah, so there are, uh, you know, it's a cottage industry out there right now, trying to come up with the, uh, the sort of Excel version of data science tools, right? right? So these sort of like plug and play, uh, you know, drag and drop type uh, machine learning uh, tools. I think that that's a ripe industry and that explains why there's so much competition in that industry right now. Um, I've seen some that are very successful and have already gotten bought up and some that are not as successful, but it's, uh, it's very exciting to see where that goes. And I think eventually. Any that we might've heard of? that are you know, either speaking at the Spark Summit or are... So one, one that pop comes to mind that, that no longer is in, uh, in play is KXEN. I think that they were... Uh, K KXEN. KXEN. Um, they, they were bought up a couple years ago and I think that they had a really quality product. 
Mike, thanks for spending the time yeah. here on the special event. You guys are hosting us at IBM. Appreciate it. Uh, this is theCUBE live in San Francisco for the IBM Community Event 2015 in conjunction with Spark Summit. We'll be here covering all the action all day tonight. Till nine o'clock, big event here. Again, developers, goodness, Spark is creating a huge wave of innovation. So stay tuned, SiliconANGLE.TV. We'll be right back after this short break.